Is Parks Canada wasting everyone's money? Is it true that you don't need an AR-15 to hunt deer? And if that's the case, then why are they being used by the government to hunt deer? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about the ongoing Sydney Island deer call debacle that Parks Canada has walked themselves into. If you remember back in December of last year, there was a story that was making pretty big waves. As the story went, Parks Canada hired a bunch of foreign sharpshooters in helicopters using AR-15s and suppressors and just high capacity magazines, the whole nine yards, explicitly for the purpose of hunting deer on a remote island out in BC. Among other things, they spent an exorbitant amount of money on it, and they also ended up killing a whole bunch of deer that they actually weren't supposed to be killing. A quarter of the 80 deer that they managed to get ended up being the wrong species. And then on top of all of this, what really stood out more to most people was the fact that they, just, they weren't using local hunters. They hired foreigners and people from the States, and actually some from New Zealand, to come over and do this hunting for them, rather than just using people who would have done it locally for free, like they've always been doing for decades. You throw all these things together and of course there was actually pretty significant outrage in the firearms and hunting community. That being said, a lot of new information about what actually happened and what is currently going on has come to light over the last month and I think that's something we should really be taking a look at. There's actually quite a lot of misinformation going on for, from both sides and I think we should really be making a point of setting the record straight. Which brings us to today's development. The National Post released a story saying that the cost of the project has doubled, and of course the CCFR went and covered it. The National Post article largely follows the same theme and the same complaints from last year, which we can break down into five easy talking points. First off, they say it's too expensive, and they even claim that the cost has doubled. Secondly, they managed to only kill 80 deer in 10 days, despite using sharpshooters on helicopters. Thirdly, as a direct result of helicopter use, nearly a quarter of the dispatch deer were of the native species and not of the invasive one. Fourth, despite all these mishaps and the huge price tag, a lot of locals and Canadians said that they would have gone and done it for free. And fifth, the National Post article today doesn't actually mention it, but we're going to include the use of AR-15s with suppressors and 30 round mags, since that's a pretty significant part of the tale as well. So we're gonna be going through these five points to really separate fact from fiction in this story. Parks Canada actually has a page themselves which details exactly what their plan is and the rationale behind what they're doing. However, their version of events is plenty suspect as well. So first off, despite the headline of the National Post article claiming it'll cost $12 million for the deer call, the article itself actually shows rather clearly that the deer call won't cost nearly that much. The $12 million is actually for the total cost of the entire project, which includes other things like ecological restoration for native plant species on the island, which is actually kind of the whole supposed underlying goal of the whole project, as well as other things such as Parks Canada employment costs for the duration of the project. So if we take a look at the Parks Canada page for the project itself, it's titled the Sydney Island Ecological Restoration Project, and it says it has three primary goals in mind. The overall goal of the project is actually to restore the native vegetation to the island, which the invasive fallow deer species are eradicating. This has led to non-native invasive plant species taking over the island. The fallow deer are not native to the area and they were originally imported from Europe about 100 years ago for the purpose of recreational hunting. Also, the fallow deer are apparently contributing to climate change. No, I'm not, not making that up. And of course, as we all know, the left's only real answer to climate change is population reduction, so unfortunately the fallow deer have to go. However, the other species of deer, which is the black-tailed deer, they are native to the area and have different non-destructive feeding habits, so they actually get to stay. Sort of, but more on that later. So $12 million is the cost of the entire project. However, the actual price tag for the deer call is only $4 million, according to information provided in the National Post article by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Now, I want to make a special note of these numbers here. We aren't going to be using them yet, but do keep them in mind as we go forward. What is rather curious, however, is the article also cites Parks Canada as stating that the deer call is to cost $6 million dollars and not $4 million. It's likely that this cost disparity is just the result of accounting for Parks Canada's expenses on top of the hired contractor's expenses, but that's close enough for government work, I suppose. But is all of this really about wildlife and preservation? I mean, like, who decided that the government should be spending all this money in the first place? Well, 
Apparently the local residents did. According to this Vancouver Sun article, private landowners voted to eradicate the deer. 52% of the island's 114 residents voted for this. Now I'll be the first to admit I'm not intimately familiar with this island, but it's worth mentioning that anyone who lives here is likely quite rich. Rich enough to have a cottage or a home on a mostly private island in fairly close proximity to several of the largest cities in BC. This would be extremely valuable real estate. So why is the government dishing out $12 million to micromanage their little island? To put that into perspective, that's about $105,000 per resident, or actually more like $210,000 per resident if you want to count only those who voted in favor of this plan. But what exactly is the plan for? To eradicate the deer to save the plant life? To restore the ecosystem? Like, aren't, aren't deer part of that ecosystem? I mean, even the European deer, I mean, they've been here for a hundred years. They've been here for a century now. They aren't exactly a foreign species at that point. There's also evidence from 2019 that the deer population had been reduced far enough that much of the native plant species were already beginning to make a comeback. This next bit is kind of speculation on my part, but as much as anything, I would bet that those who voted in favor of this change merely wanted hunters off of their private little island paradise, and they were happy to eradicate the wildlife in order to do it. So not only has the government spent a ton of money on this, but they're not exactly getting great results here. Parks Canada separates the deer call into two phases. Phase one is what happened last December. That was the big story that we all heard about. And phase two is set to happen this winter where they're going to be finishing the job. So what happened during phase one? It says here, phase one of the eradication of fallow deer took place over 10 days between December 1st and 11th in 2023. During this phase, three highly trained certified marksmen used globally supported methods to mainly reduce the deer population on Sydney Island. A total of 84 deer were removed during this period through a combination of nighttime ground-based hunting and daytime aerial work. The aerial work included one marksman operating out of a single helicopter deployed for a total of 15 hours across five days. So according to Parks Canada, that's what happened last December. So the first thing to clear up is the helicopter. According to Parks Canada, it was a single marksman three hours a day over five days. I think a lot of us really had this idea that it was just a squad of dudes all kitted up, you know, ARs and 30 round mags and suppressors flying over the canopy of the forest, blaring, you know, fortunate suns over the radios like some opening to a Vietnam War film. And it turns out that was just not really the case here. It was only a single marksman and the helicopter was rarely even used. Additionally, while I'm sure some of the deer were actually called from the helicopter, much of the helicopter's use was apparently used for scouting the terrain since they were kind of unfamiliar from the location because, again, Canada elected to not use locals for this task. This is also supported by the claim that most of the deer were, quote, dispatched with a single shot, end quote. And that makes a lot of sense. Contrary to what you see in the movies, helicopters are actually not a particularly stable shooting platform. You aren't going to be making precision shots, you know, like through a forest from 200 yards out on a helicopter. That's just not realistic. Yet if you're closer than that, the deer will probably not be stationary when you start shooting at them. Meaning there's no realistic way you're going to be reliably taking them with just one shot. So the idea that all of these deer were shot from a helicopter full of militant dudes just meg dumping a deer is, it's just simply not accurate. As it turns out, they were mostly taken on the ground at night which means they had three people on foot with AR-style firearms, suppressors, and they were likely equipped with night vision. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's really any better. But here's the kicker. If they were taken from the ground, how come nearly a quarter of the deer killed were not the targeted fallow deer species, but actually the native local black-tailed deer species? Night vision is plenty capable of differentiating between the two. The claim we've heard from all these news sources was if you were on the ground rather than in a helicopter, shooting the wrong deer would never have happened. Yet it looks like that's actually exactly what happened. So how did this happen and what mistakes were made? And this is something that actually every news article and story on the matter just gets blatantly wrong. Well, there's actually two things they get consistently wrong. First off, this is an eradication and not a deer cull. So it says here, a cull refers to removing many, but not all, individuals from a population. Eradication is the complete removal of the population. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it is entirely part of Parks Canada's plan to eradicate every single deer on the island 
regardless of species. According to their plan, there is no such thing as the wrong deer species. They fully intend to purge all of them from the island. So these foreign professional hunters were doing exactly their job according to plan when they dispatched the black-tailed deer. Even if Canada had done the sensible thing and hired locals or other Canadians for the job, we would have been required to do the exact same thing. Which brings us to the next common gripe about this whole plan. Why didn't they just use locals or Canadians? Like, it, it's regularly stipulated that Canadians would have done the job for free, and I certainly think they would have. However, if the goal is total eradication, I think that'd actually be quite difficult for a bunch of disconnected hunters to pull that off. Sydney Island is rather small. It's a mere 9 kilometers squared total. But even if you dumped 500 hunters there for a month, there's still not like a 100% like a guarantee that you could get every single deer. So what alternatives are there? I think that with even a small amount of coordination for Parks Canada, I kind of struggle to see why you couldn't do it with just a few hundred hunters. Sydney Island is, even at its widest point, only two kilometers wide. If you bring like 200 hunters down, you space them out 10 meters apart, you could create a firing line and just kind of like march to the shoreline, shooting every deer that you encounter. From the airstrip, you could very easily move to the coast in back in a day. You could then have the world's coolest camping party and hangout that night at the airstrip. Then you could wake up and march the other direction, taking the deer on the other half of the island. At most, this is, this is like a two-day exercise, not a multi-year, six million dollar project. Not only would these guys do it for free, but odds are you could even create a fundraiser or some kind of lottery system for this. You could sell tickets like $50 or $100 a piece. I bet you could sell thousands of them, or maybe even tens of thousands of them for that price. And for this kind of experience. You could just have a draw and see who goes. Now, if you're a government and free or profitable isn't really your idea of a good time, realistically, you could even pay each of them like $1,000 per day if that makes you feel better. I mean, that'd be the best two days of any hunter's life. Getting paid two grand to go on a two-day hike in the country to hunt deer? I'll make that deal. How about you, you bitch? You make that deal? I'd make that deal. I don't blame you. Damn good deal. I mean, you couldn't sign me up fast enough. This plan is kind of a hypothetical, but these numbers were not chosen accidentally. $2,000 times 200 hunters is $400,000, which is how much the government actually spent on their three sharpshooters for 10 days last December. Not including Parks Canada's own costs, Phase 1 cost the government $561,000 just for the hunters alone. If you want to take out the $67,000 for the helicopter services and assume that they used none of their contingency money, which let's be honest, it's the government, they probably used that all on day one. But if you want to take those costs out of there, they spent $385,000 on three people for 10 days. Which means that each of these sharpshooters cost the government almost $13,000 per person per day. Now, a lot of that is equipment costs and so on, but even just their wages that are laid out in the operational personnel section amounts to a staggering $164,000 for three people for 10 days. That's just, that's utterly insane. That, that's crazy how much money that is. And just getting their certification was $80,000 for three people. I mean, my firearms course for, for my pal and my R pal was a few hundred dollars total. So why is it costing them over $25,000 to get these professionals licensed? If they are, in fact, professional-grade marksmen with global experience in calls and eradications, shouldn't this process be, like, a little more streamlined? $25,000 even for random people is an insane price tag, let alone those who should have a proven track record. Yet, despite this massive price tag, they managed to dispatch only 84 deer. If you factor in the current estimated population numbers by Parks Canada, which is that there are somewhere between 300 and 900 deer on the island, 84 deer is not even more than the number of births that they're likely to have this year from those deer. Meaning that despite all the money they spent last year to thin the herd, the deer population on the island is probably higher now than it was before Phase 1 started. Like $800,000 spent on Phase 1 and it actually produced probably negative progress. The plan from the professionals is to come back this winter and fence up the island into a bunch of sections and then clear each section with dogs and boots on the ground, which I think is a pretty good idea. That should work pretty well. 
However, they also plan on employing sharpshooters from boats offshore shooting inland towards the island. Which is... I mean, but that's, that's an awful idea. Like, that is a bizarrely bad plan. Because on this island, there's a whole bunch of little houses dotted all over the place, kind of randomly. So you're basically going to be shooting from an unstable shooting platform towards deer and hoping you don't miss and just smoke somebody's house or maybe even hit somebody. Like, that that's an awful, awful plan. Like, the, the fence of the dog part is fine, but the boats are eight. I mean, it's just a shockingly awful idea. However, that seems to be the best plan they could manage to come up with, so we just have to hope that nothing bad happens. And lastly, this brings us to the big controversy over the firearms that were used. Our next article takes us over to the good people at thegunblog.ca. And I'm not going to be detailing this whole article, but I do highly recommend you read at least this one for yourself, since it's a pretty quick read. And the links to all of these stories will be in the description down below. So in early May, they released an exclusive interview that they had done with Parks Canada, where it was disclosed that the type of firearms used were in fact not AR-15s like everyone originally thought, but actually CZ Bren 2 MSs. For those who don't know, the Bren 2 MS is a semi-automatic rifle which shoots 223 or 556 ammunition and uses AR-15 mags, which are commonly referred to as Stenag mags. The particular Brens they opted to use for this hunt had shorter 11 and a half inch barrels, which made them restricted firearms. As most of you probably already know, normally you can't actually hunt with a restricted firearm. You actually require special permission, which of course our professionals here got. Lots of provinces won't even let you hunt with a 223 cartridge. Although some provinces have begun to come around to the idea, as is the case in my home province of Saskatchewan. Woo! So let's see what Parks Canada had to say about their choice of firearm for this operation. They said, automatic rifles, like the AR-15, are prohibited in Canada and they were not considered for this project. No prohibited or banned firearms were used. <laughs> Calm down, we'll come back to that later. The firearm used in phase one was in fact the CZ Bren 2. The CZ Bren 2 is a restricted firearm that can only be used in Canada if the appropriate authorities have been granted. In this case, the appropriate authorities were granted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the province of British Columbia. The ammunition that they used was Lehigh Defense Controlled Chaos 223 Copper. There was a lot of speculation initially that they might have been using frangible rounds, but as it turns out, they were just using copper hollow points, which is a pretty typical hunting round for 223 ammunition. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. They go on to say, semi-automatic firearms of this style are the standard used in professional ungulate eradication operations around the world. Now, ungulates is just the fancy scientific word for mammals who have hooves and are herbivores. Most of the things you hunt in North America are ungulates, with the exception of a few animals such as bears. These firearms are chosen because they are reliable, least prone to jamming, can be fitted with a quality suppressor that reduces the stress level of animals as well as their awareness to the eradication activity, and have a magazine of sufficient size so that reloading isn't necessary in the middle of work. So first, let's address the elephant in the room. AR-15s are not automatic rifles. They are semi-automatic rifles with virtually identical capabilities to their restricted Bren 2. And also not only the Bren 2, but tons of other semi-automatic 223 rifles out there. Including this. This is my WK-180C Gen 2, and it is a non-restricted rifle. And just like ARs and the Bren, this rifle also takes the same 223 ammo, and it takes the same AR patterned mags. And has the same semi-automatic fire rate. I also have access to these copper hollow point rounds, which are totally legal, and they make actually pretty effective hunting ammunition. I mean, there's even a deer on this box. These can be easily acquired by normal civilians with a standard PAL. So what this means is we have three firearms here with virtually identical capabilities. Yet this one is non-restricted, the Bren 2 is restricted, and the AR-15 is prohibited. So, in other words, this one is appropriate for hunting, the Bren 2 is not appropriate for hunting, and the AR-15 is actually illegal to own, despite the fact that they all have, like, essentially the same capabilities. And that's the problem when you get away from regulating firearms based on capabilities and common sense, and devolve into some smear campaign based on arbitrary labels. Which is essentially how all of Canada's gun control laws have been made. I mean, like, for example, the term sharpshooters is regularly used in our articles, as well as in the Parks Canada official document. The Bren 2 was the firearm of choice for our sharpshooters. Does that make the Bren 2 now an assault-style sniper rifle? 
Like, of course, that's a ridiculous idea for anyone who knows anything about semi-automatic modern sporting rifles, but it would be the exact sort of nonsense logic that the gun control types regularly use to brainwash people who don't actually know anything about semi-automatic modern sporting rifles. And what I find particularly disturbing about all of this is Parks Canada going well out of their way to toe the party line and show blatant partisanship. I mean, Parks Canada really shouldn't be political, but here they are overtly lying about ARs being automatic firearms, which is part of the same package of lies that liberal politicians in the gun control lobby say about us and our firearms. I mean, Parks Canada clearly understands the difference between semi-automatic and fully automatic, but they chose to lie about the AR-15 anyway. And if you think I'm being a little excessive here, just look at their use of the word Marks people. Not Marks men, not Marks women, not even a normal gender neutral word like, you know, sharpshooter, which we've been using frequently throughout this whole process. No, instead, we went with Marks people. Can that remind you of anybody? So we'd like you to look uh, we, we like to say people kind, not necessarily mankind. Thank you. We can all learn from each other. Now, speaking of narcissists, Shudo also famously said, But you don't need an AR-15 to bring down a deer. This was the backbone of the rationale he used to unlawfully ban over 1,500 models of sporting and hunting rifles back in May of 2020. And yet, here we see Parks Canada essentially saying that AR-15 style rifles with suppressors are the global standard used to harvest deer and deer-like animals. Which, in a lot of places and for a lot of people, they, they absolutely are. This is just another straw on the ever-growing pile of evidence for how flawed Canada's gun laws are and how wrong Trudeau's gun control policies are. And it's nothing more than just another straw for the Liberals to ignore. So, I'd like to thank you all for watching. What do you guys think of these revelations? Are you shocked at how mismanaged your taxes are? Or perhaps you're surprised at how it's actually not as bad as you thought? If you had the choice, would you volunteer to hunt this island for free? Or would you be unwilling to partake in a controlled eradication exercise? Let me know in the comment section down below. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.